Welcome back everyone. In this video, we're going to take a look at one of my favorite hex editors, the 010 editor, or as I commonly refer to it as the 010 editor. Um, you can find this tool on sweetscape.com. And like many projects that are out there, this has a, a limited 30 day free trial as well as then pricing information. So it'll obviously be up to you to determine whether or not you find this one worth purchasing. Um, now, I have found it to be quite valuable in certain scenarios. Um, like many tools, even hex editors, there are a number of hex editors that I use. And the scenario that I'm going to describe in this video is, is going to be kind of exemplary of why and when I decide to use 010. Okay, if you don't have 010 already installed, you can go to the download section and uh, choose the, the download installer for the operating system of your choice, Windows, Mac, Linux. In addition to that, um, there, it is available for installation using Choco or Chocolatey. This is a, basically a package manager for Windows. I'll probably present this and talk about it in more detail in, uh, in a separate video. But suffice it to say, you can do Choco install 010 editor and from, a, from an elevated PowerShell or command prompt. Um, so running as an administrator, and that'll also get it installed on your system. Upon launching the 010 editor, you'll, um, you'll the first time you'll get presented with this, this welcome screen. And it just lays out a couple of basic things. You have your theme, dark, um, light, or I guess older themes. And uh, I typically just go with the dark. Uh, we have binary templates and then the 010 repository. So I'll get into the templates and the repository here in, in just a minute because these are really the primary reasons why or when I choose to use the 010 editor. So we'll dismiss that. Um, from there, you'll see that there is a startup tab. Of course, all of this is configurable through the settings and, and sometimes even through the different windows that open. They'll have options to select or say, for example, that welcome screen um, to, to unselect it so that it doesn't show up every time you launch 010. Now, the startup screen will have recent files. So if there's files that you're editing regularly, of course, those will be easily accessible there. Um, or we can just go ahead and, and select the folder icon in order to open a file. Like many Windows-based tools that have a GUI, we have a um, you know all the file menu options above, and then icons that represent probably some of the more common activity that users perform. Okay, so here I'm going to pick an executable from a recent demo, and what's going to happen when I open that is in this case, and oftentimes the case, if O1O has a what's called a template then it's going to prompt you and ask you if you want to install that. So PE files being a very common um, file format to look at in a hex editor, there is, of course, a template, um, exe.bt, that we can install and apply. Now, if you've watched any of the previous videos where I've used 010 editor, particularly around the PE files, and likely I've used, you've seen that in action. You've seen what the template can do. But I'm not going to assume that. And so what we'll do at this point, we can install the template, we can ignore it, we can ask later or help. So I'm just gonna say ask later, we'll actually install it ourselves in just a moment. Now, if we don't apply the template at this point to this binary file format, then we have just a traditional um, hex editor view. We have the offset in hex, we have the actual byte values, the default is, and for many hex editors then is 16 bytes per row, and then off to the right hand side, we have the ASCII representation of that data. So, you know, in, in the occasion where there might be ASCII content in the binary content that we're looking at. Okay, um, it has tabs, as again, you're probably accustomed to in a Windows environment with GUI based applications, especially things that allow us to look at multiple files so we could continue to open files there. And then off to the right hand side, we have the, the mini bar, or the thumbnail view, or it's referred to as a number of different things that just allow us to really quickly navigate up and down the content of the file um, or whatever content we're actually looking at. Now, one feature that I don't really use all that often, but I think could be pretty pretty handy is the open process because there is an there is occasion where oftentimes I'm debugging something, piece of malware, trying to reverse something, and I'm using a tool like Process Hacker in order to investigate memory. Well, if we go to File Open Process, then you can see very similar, and uh, you'll have to excuse the text is a little crowded here just because I, I usually bump the font size up for these, um, these recordings, but we can see that we can choose processes much like we could with Process Hacker 2, um, which is my, my go-to, and then look at the different allocations, the addresses, and we could select that. So let's just say uh, we want to look at a read-write region of memory. For whatever reasons, this address was something that was interesting to us. 
So we could select that, we could open it, and now we get the content of that processes or that 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 memory here um, inside of our hex editor. So now we could investigate that. Now I don't know exactly what that allocation was being used for in this particular instance. Um, so I don't really know. I'm not looking for anything in particular here. That's just to show that it is a pretty handy feature. Um, again, Process Hacker as a as a one of the you know several process exploration tools that are out there has a very similar capability. So it's it's completely up to you. But you know if you're already doing some work in O and O, that might be something that you consider. Um, another area of kind of capability, that, and one that I you know admittedly I don't I don't use too often are the scripts. And you have a number of options here for the scripts. You can create a new one yourself. You can open an existing edit, run a script, and then we're going to skip down here. We have the script repository and, and view the installed scripts. So this idea of a repository, and you're going to see this with scripts and with templates, is that there is a collection of things available, but, you know, almost like a like a store. All of these scripts that are available that you can view and then install if you want to use that script for for your your you know your local analysis environment. Um, any scripts that you already have installed will be available in this section. So you can see for binary, I've actually already installed one. There'll be just a, a limited number, at least in my experience, a limited number of scripts that just come installed by default. Uh, but I installed this XOR selection, and what we can do is invoke any of these scripts by simply selecting them. So. Before we do that, if let's say we want to look at the script repository, this will pull up a little dialog. We can search and we can look um, essentially at the scripts by kind of broader categorization, right? So here's binary scripts like doing an XOR, um, bookmarks, checksum, clipboard, uh, any major category that the script falls under. So that allows you to look through them if you just you know want to get an idea of what's out there. Again, if you have an idea already, you can just search. So for example, let's say I want to do something with XORing. Well, here's the XOR scripts that are available in the repository. And as I said, I've already installed the XOR selection. So you can see once I've selected that, we have options here to install or uninstall. Let's say I want to do the XOR selection hex. I haven't installed that one yet. Well, now I can install that. Um, down below, there's a table with available information, history information, and author information. So in this case, the XOR selection comes from a pretty well-known name in the security industry, Didier Stevens. Um, and if you haven't run across his tools, odds are you've probably used them without realizing it, or I would encourage you to search his name right now um, because he has a lot of great, great resources out there and available for free. Um, okay, so again, once we've installed it, now we can run the script. Now, as the, the script name implied, this was going to XOR a selection. So I've selected some bytes, selected the script, and now it says, all right, if you want to run the script, the input we need is a key. This can be one byte value. So let's just say hex uh, 89, or I'm just picking something arbitrarily that's valid. Uh, you'll see the script prompts you or tells you, hey, you gotta have a zero X, and then you go, okay. And now all of those bytes were XORed with that key. Um, anything, um, any X, any value XOR with zero is that value. So all of those null bytes you can see are now hex 89. And incidentally, um, you will find from time to time XOR encoded data, XOR encoded PE files, um, or I guess I should say XOR encrypted. And, you know, because there's so many null bytes in the PE file, uh, you know, it, if it just happens, if they just happen to use that technique, this can be an easy win. Because uh, if you see, hey, this doesn't look like a PE file, but I see hex 89 repeating over and over and over. You might as well try that. That might be the key and you might have an easy one there. But in any case, um, what we're looking at is now, let's say we want to run that script again. We can select it, provide the key, either what we know to be the key or what we suspect. In this case, we both know it and suspect it. And there we go. Now that's sort of decrypted our payload. Uh, or, our, or our, a selection there, so it's back to the original bytes. Um, of course, we have redo, uh, you know, edit, undo, and so we could have done that as well, but in any case. So scripts, right? A lot of stuff there you can explore. Um, the other is templates then. So moving to the next major feature, and this is really the primary reason that I use it. Um, very similar to scripts, you can create your own template, you can open a template, you can edit, you can run a template. 
uh, as well as view the, the repository and those that you already have installed. So we didn't install the executable. And if we wanted to do that, well, we could come in here, we could search for it, easy enough, just go exe, and you can see that matches on exe.bt. If you weren't sure what that was, well, this will tell you. This parses Windows executable, exe, dll, and sys files for both 32 and 64 bit, okay? We definitely want that. I want to install it. Um, it looks like I've already had it installed, so probably just something that I was, you know, that, that happened during me getting ready to record this. I'll just say overwrite. Um, and of course, if we wanted to explore other binary file formats or other templates that help to understand, you know, a data structure um, or a file format that isn't easy to parse just by looking at it with, with our eyes, you know, you're going to be able to scroll through here and, and find those. So we have things like ELF, which is your Linux executables and your Macos, font file types, games, images, um, you name it. Um, and not everything certainly is going to be in here, but this is a really good place to start. And once that template has been installed, just like the scripts, we now have sort of the major category. And we can go to the template that we're after and say, all right, let's, let's apply that template to this file. And if all goes well, you will get uh, essentially the results of that template and now the ability to map the, that template structure to the actual content and, and understand more about the file that you're investigating. So really helpful. Now, if the file is, is corrupt, let's say it's a PE file, maybe it's, I don't know, you dumped it from memory because it's, it's part of some unpacking process and you didn't get a good dump. Well, you might find then that because there's some malformations in the data that the template doesn't apply correctly, in which case then you will usually get a prompt that just says that hey, Owen, Owen, Ed, Owen O Editor was unable to apply the template effectively to the file format. And that's going to go for any templates that you use. If it doesn't map you know, cleanly in the way that the template was designed to parse that structure, then it's going to prompt you with a warning. That's not to say that some of the, the template didn't apply, right? I've had PE files where I still was able to parse maybe, you know, the majority of the header, but, or some of, you know, the, the DOS header and the image NT headers and some of these early in the file headers, but then something later on, maybe in the sections got corrupt. And so there was some problems there, right? And so I was still able to use it for certain things, just not all of the, uh, all of what I was after. Okay, much like scripts, if you're really interested in the script or the template, you can go to edit template. Um, I'm not sure why this doesn't double click and go to a large screen, but hey, I can do this, I guess. And what's nice about this is it really will tell you everything that has been defined in order to represent that template. So again, if I was really interested, you're really interested in understanding more about the, the PE file format, whatever file format, whatever template you're, you're, you know, you're, you're utilizing and investigating, um, this will give you a pretty good, um, this will give you a pretty good understanding, not only of how the template works, but then that structure that it's being applied to. So you can always open these up and take a look and try to understand what's going on there. If you know, what's being displayed to you in the editor isn't there. Um, of course, this allows you then to extend and make your own templates um, or modify a template that exists. Maybe it doesn't work quite right or there's capabilities or features that you want to add to it. Okay, so wanted to keep this short. That's a brief introduction to O1O because I use this editor all the time. I wanted to have something a little bit more kind of baseline to say this is what it is. This is the main reasons I use it. And that way when you see it, you know, either in previous videos or, or, or hopefully in the videos to follow, it makes more sense. If you have any questions or any other really cool use cases, please feel free to drop them in the comments. Otherwise, I'll see you all in the next video.